Culture on I24 News. I'm Ben Grober, thank you so much for joining me. Today on our show, we'll talk about the legacy of Israeli satirist Ephraim Kishon. We'll take a look at a Palestinian artist and her unique canvas. And we'll ask, is Netflix sustainable? Ephraim Kishon was an Israeli satirist, author, playwright, and filmmaker who passed away in 2005. His work came to represent a certain view of Israel in the 1960s and 70s, sometimes absurd and frustrating, but also warm and familiar. This weekend, that event will present new short films based on his work. And joining me now via Skype from New York to talk about the man and his career is Kishon's son, Amir Kishon. Hi, Amir. Thank you uh, so much for taking the time to speak to us. Hi, Udez. How are you? I'm doing uh, uh, great. A lot warmer than you are, I'm sure. Um, let me ask you, uh, first off, because these are uh, new short films that will be screened. They're based on your father's work, stories that some of them have been written decades ago. Were you surprised at all that, that young people can easily relate to his work? Well, that's a that's a great question because um, <clears throat> we were um, this this is, uh, event essentially celebrates uh, the anniversary of my father's death in 2005 and and, and also um, commemorate his uh, his and celebrate his uh, work. Now, um, in 2005, we were handled a very big load. Um, it was uh, first, uh, my father was very prolific and one of the most successful and prolific Israeli writers. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very diligent. So he wrote 40 million books. Uh, sorry, 40 million, uh, 45 books with about 40, over 40 million um, published. Um, this was um, first kind of uh, one of our interests is to, to kind of promote his book worldwide. Yeah. He also was, uh, uh, became a, a, a screenmaker, a, a filmmaker, and uh, he, he made four of uh, one of the most uh, celebrated Israeli movies. Certainly. Uh, very, very successful as a filmmaker as well, and as a, as a writer before that. But what do you think it is that, that keeps his work relevant today? Well, he wrote, essentially he wrote not about Israel, he wrote about the human condition. I mean, the human, it's about satire. As he said, when he writes, he writes about, um, he basically narrates the truth, and the truth is funny. <laughs> and so I think it reaches everyone in many respects. And uh, this really resonated in, in, in Europe and resonated in the Far East, and we are all the same. So I, um, wherever he went um, and wherever he focused, he was successful. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, point that you're raising, because in Israel, he's certainly um, can, perceived as, as a very Israeli writer, but he was, in fact, very successful all around the world. Is it still happening to this day, his, his international success? Uh, yeah, um, and actually, we are looking at different... We are, as I said, we are, we are basically trying to promote his, uh, his, his, his legacy and... Uh, one of the things that we would really would like to focus is not just um, promoting that, but actually taking the vast uh, mass of his uh, creation and translating it to a new generation. Because, you know, um, he wrote about, for example, how to look for a good lawyer. Um, this is where it was true in 1970s as much as it was true in 2015. So. Um, it is it is something that we kind of feel devoted to kind of bring that to a younger uh, generation and um, we do that globally. Um, yeah, I'm, actually, I'm afraid that question uh, is uh, always going to be relevant, how to find a good lawyer, and it's not a simple answer either. Now, you also mentioned how, how prolific he was. Um, as his son, how devoted was he to his work? Well, that's a, uh, that's interesting. First, uh, my father always said that he hate he hates writing, and uh, he said that this is very very boring. And, uh, <laughs> so he was a masochist, actually. Sorry. 
He was a masochist, actually. If, if he did yeah. not enjoy it, he, he certainly did a lot of it. So you, you would imagine that if somebody claims that something is boring, he would not do that. But as far as I remember him, he was basically sitting on his chair and writing for basically the balance of, of our, our lives, uh, excluding few uh, trips and some... Uh, he had a, a floor, a top floor in our house, so when you got down to us and uh, sat with the family. I see. Now, a lot of uh, uh, people know him for his film career, and uh, that is uh, perhaps the, the part that remains the most lively one. How did he make the move to, to cinema? Well, this was a, a really a guy that actually um, decided on doing something, learned it from from scratch and then start doing that. So, for example, with Hebrew, he just got to Israel when he was 24. He didn't know any word in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. So he decided mm -hmm. to be an Israeli writer. And in order to do that, he studied the dictionary by heart. This is a known story about him. So when he decided to make movies, he basically um, took some, some books, read about making movies, start doing some uh, experiments with his eight millimeters camera and then uh, started, uh, basically started doing Salah, which is his first movie. Now, he, he said when he was uh, kind of got to the first day um, of shooting Salah, that was, by the way, uh, won, a Golden won a Golden Globe mm -hmm. and was nominated for the Oscars, mm -hmm. um, he said, uh, guys, how do you make a movie on his first day? <laughs> and um, it turns out that it was a very successful movie. By the way, uh, just as an anecdote, 1.3 million uh, Israelis saw the movie out yeah. of 3, 3 million uh, Hebrew no, speakers. An unbelievable success, uh, nothing like it uh, uh, till the, to that day or since, I think. On a more uh, personal level, what kind of father was he? Horrible. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> Uh, seriously, he was. He was um, first uh, for us. It's a. It's a big present because um, he was. He was a great father, and we were. We were basically um, living. Uh, obviously, uh, his his art. But what we have benefited from is that if he didn't do something, he did it in his stories. So we have two, in, in many respects, two universes to play with. One is the real family life and then what he wrote in his in his in his stories which is essentially um what he uh, aspired to be if he didn't make it i see i see well you can uh, pick and choose between the two uh so there's this event coming up what else can we uh, expect to see uh from from your father uh well from what from the work he left behind uh, in the future so I just want to say that this event is essentially um, the c conclusion of uh, the, this 10th anniversary. And um, we, we worked with uh, Karen Gesher, uh, Gesher Fund, and the Second Authority to actually create a new, um, a new type of, uh, not a new type, but a, 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 a competition mm -hmm. for short and satirical movies that are inspired by uh, my father's creation. And this will be shown in the Cinematheque in Tel Aviv on uh, this Friday on the 29th. Right. But as I said, we are looking at a, a really a universal um, mass of work. And we are working on several projects. Basically, uh, this will be interesting to know. We are, uh, one of his, uh, one of his, we are bringing one of his films to Berlin. This is huh? a, a, a German movie. Um, I'll just uh, share with you some of our projects. Um, we also are working in bringing the, the, what is referred to as the, the marriage certificate, one of his plays, from Tel Aviv and translating it into a new generation um, play called, uh, that will be in Brooklyn, that we call the marriage certificate, but it will translate from Tel Aviv, migrate that into Brooklyn, so Brooklyn. 2016. I see, so wherever you may be in the world uh, in whatever language you may speak you can uh, look up something by Fine Kishon there's a very good chance you'll find something Emil thank you so much for uh, taking the time and speaking to us pleasure thanks moving on now a young Palestinian artist tries to raise awareness to the Palestinian struggle using the objects of resistance as her canvas more in this story by Danny Swibel 
A 16-year-old Palestinian artist from Gaza has been representing the struggle of the Palestinian people in a novel way through drawings on stones. Amal al-Kahlut's choice is symbolic, as some Palestinians consider the stone to be one of the symbols of resistance. The teen said since late 1987, the beginning of the first Intifada, or Palestinian uprising, the stone has been the Palestinian people's main weapon in clashes against Israeli forces. She says her art represents the current conflict. We lived during the latest intifada, especially those of my generation who have not been through the first and second intifada. We only used to hear about it. But this third intifada, we are witnessing it, and we have lived during it, so it had a bigger impact on us. The stone for other people and to those abroad might have no worth, but for me, for the Palestinian people and the Palestinian issue, it is the basis of the Palestinian Intifada. Amal's father said from a young age his daughter used to express her ideas and feelings about the Intifada through cartoon drawings, a talent he tried to help cultivate. We didn't deprive her of anything, like the drawing items. She draws on paper and even uses oil colors. We used to get her everything she needed. We backed her and we encouraged her to draw because the more one practices, his talents develop. Amal has not sold any of her artworks. She said her aim is not to make a profit from the art, which she simply hopes can raise awareness about the ongoing Palestinian struggle. In a moment, we'll see if Netflix can chill. But first, here's our cultural recommendation for today. The exhibition De La Croix and the Rise of Modern Art traces the influence of the avant-garde master from the end of the 19th century and throughout the 20th. The styles of Matisse, Kandinsky, Van Gogh, Gauguin, the vibrant colors, the shapes, the expressiveness, can all be traced to the works of Eugène De La Croix, first of the modern masters whose impact on French painting cannot be overstated. By placing Delacroix's work alongside that of his contemporaries such as Courbet and Géricault, the exhibition traces 50 years of his legacy and the impact he had on generations of artists to come. As Cézanne said, we all paint in Delacroix's language. And now uh, Daniel Roth, uh, aka D. Roth, is in the studio. That is that is my that is my the, alias. That's, that you? is precisely my alias. <laughs> uh, we're talking Netflix, right? Netflix uh, made some big announcement uh, announcements recently, and uh, but there's also all kind of talk about what might happen to them. Then, yes, please. there's a lot of uh, mixed messages about Netflix. They also went to dozens of new countries in mm -hmm. the last couple of weeks. It was including big, Israel? Including Israel. Lots of people very, very excited. Uh, at the same time, though, the numbers aren't great in the U.S. So it's begging the question in business circles, uh, what is the cap? What's what's kind of the limit that Netflix can can hit? And one of the answers is, well, it hit it in the U.S. and its number of subscribers. They're still adding subscribers, but that but at number much is lower rates. at much much lower rates. Yeah. But they're adding new countries, and those countries have new subscribers, and new countries are connecting to the internet. But so, they also have a lot more expenses. I mean, and they're spending, you know, huge amounts of money on content, which is something they didn't use to. $4.8 billion is going, which is more than half of, of their expenses, yep. is going to paying other TV networks and movie studios for their content. Right, so right. it's huge. It's a huge expense. But they're also spending $5 billion, they've announced, on new content that they're providing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so they're. Uh, I mean, they're they're sort of putting putting huge numbers of money out into the content. Are they world. bringing these these sums of money in as well? Not quite, and this is one of the big questions. But their stock keeps going up. 
actually. Their stock was at a low a couple of years ago of something like $7. It's well over $100. So uh, overall, they're not, this is the thing though, it's not just about the money, it's not just about the subscribers. These are the, the, the calculations we're using, but actually they may be changing something fundamental about the way the movie and TV industry runs, mm -hmm. which is sort of a more direct to subscriber uh, money rolling in every month, spending on content, less on infrastructure way of doing things that's shifting how many episodes of a, of a show you order, whether you order a pilot and then you check it out, see if you want to buy a season. Instead, they're buying two seasons at a time, forcing other people to follow their model now right. because right. of their growing success. So I guess uh, it all comes down to whether you think they have peaked already or uh, um, the, it is still in the future. Um, buy, sell, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with buy and sell. <laughs> Always safe. Uh, Always thanks, safe. Daniel. Thank you. That's uh, it from us for today. Thank you uh, so much for watching. Please check out our website, i24news.tv, to find uh, more content even. And uh, join us again tomorrow.